If you are a visual artist of any sort, be it a concept artist or an illustrator or a photographer or a prop and costume maker, whether you draw cute animals or you put badass stock footage or stock photos of yourself online, if you're doing any sort of visual art and publish it especially on social media, you would benefit a lot from tagging or branding or watermarking your images. What I'm talking about is putting a clearly readable link to your site or at least your name inside of your picture itself and possibly also a logo. In this video I will talk about the do's, the don'ts, the good, the bad and the ugly of branding or tagging your picture. I will use my own examples from various projects that I worked on and I will also use some examples from my friends and colleagues including world famous artists such as Mike Corriero or Piper Thibodeau and a few others. So thank you very much to everyone who has submitted their work for me to criticize and to use as example. By the end of this video you will hopefully have a more thorough understanding of why and how to do this stuff. I will also at the end of the video show you how to make a simple Photoshop action which will allow you to tag your pictures with just a button press which I have found to be a huge time saver. Before we go into endless amount of detail that helps you understand all of this stuff, for all the people who just want the takeaway message, here is what I'm doing. I just use a clearly readable font that is clearly readable even if you scale it down and to improve its readability to the max, I use a white font color with a black outline. You can also see I'm dimming it a bit, so it's like 75 or something percent opacity, so it's not too much in your face, but you still can read it even if the picture is scaled down. Why it is important, I will talk about it in a sec, don't worry, but that's the takeaway point. Uh, the font choice is also a font that doesn't try to be fancy or artistic too much, it's just very technical, just a mark, uh, which leads me to the base principles of this all. And the principle number one is add as much as needed in terms of tagging and branding, but as little as possible at the same time. You don't want it interfering with your picture, you don't want it biting into the picture, you don't want it to do much except being there, being noticeable, but not actually grabbing any artistic attention, if that makes any sort of sense. Because you are showing your work, you're not showing your branding, no one, no one cares about how good your branding looks, everyone cares about your work. Also what I see a lot of times happen, especially with people who are cosplayers or prop makers or anything of the sort, so people who don't do graphical design or illustration, those people will a lot of times have a logo that looks something like this, which is a crude mashup I did here of things to never do. And the problem with that is they feel like they need to include a logo, but you really don't have to have a logo and it's a lot better to have just plain text referring back to you than to have a logo that is a lot worse than your actual work that you're trying to show and have that logo basically drain the whole positive energy out of your work that you're showing. So I will talk more about logo design later. So the takeaway point here is better to not have a logo unless you have a professional looking logo ready. Another thing that I believe to be true is that it is a lot better to have a domain even if you don't have a website and have that domain redirect to for example your social media which is what I'm doing. I didn't find the time to make a website for the last seven years but I, st but I still have the nuclearsnell.com domain which redirects to my Facebook. Now why is it better? Because the social platform you're on might die one day, a sudden death, it happened before. Also you might not be on that platform anymore for some reason, but in the years of you being an artist and spreading your pictures uh, throughout the world, it is possible that they will just stay on Bob's art blog or whatever and people will see them there later or find them through Google later. And if your link is to your Facebook site, but your Facebook site no longer exists, well, that's a bit of a problem. On the other hand, if you have your domain and uh, keep in mind to refresh it regularly, that is pretty much gonna last as long as you keep an eye on it. 
you know, it belongs to you and can, you can at any time redirect it anywhere else. Or maybe one day I'll get around to making a website for myself and then it will be just my website. And pictures that I've put out on the internet uh, 10 years ago with this marking will still lead to my most current presence. So this is why having a domain is a good idea. Now, if you don't have a domain, if you're on Facebook, uh, fb.com is a valid abbreviation. You don't have to spell out facebook.com. Remember, as little as possible. So fb.com slash your page's name will do just fine. Also, you don't need HTTP slash slash or www because modern browsers autocomplete that. Let's talk for a second about why I believe it is so important to mark or brand your pictures within the picture itself and why I think it's insufficient to just rely on people finding you some other way. So when you publish your work online and it's good enough, it will be shared a lot and it will be shared all over the place. People will share it on the same social network you published it on. They will save it on their computer and show to their friends later. They will uh, save it and publish in their art blog. They will do all kinds of stuff with it. I do not believe that many of them will remove your link maliciously or anything like that. Some reposters do that. I don't understand why. It doesn't diminish your achievement as a content site or something to keep the original artist link. If anything, you're doing a better job because you're telling your audience where to see more of that. But anyway, some few people will do this. However, most people will not be messing with your link on purpose. They just want content and they just care about what's happening here, right? They don't care about your link. If it's not obtrusive, they will not care about it. They might think twice about sharing it and decide not to share it if your branding is too obnoxious, like you see me having mocked up here. Like if I was a content site, I would, I would not share this because it's just too much obnoxious branding going on. It's too much. It messes with the picture. But if it's decent, I don't care as a reposter, as a potential reposter, if it says nuclearsnail.com in the corner or not. But when people repost it, it will get scaled, it will get to other platforms and so on and so forth. So uh, you just want to ensure that wherever it ends up, it's a robust branding and the most robust branding uh, possible is in the picture itself. This is why it works. Let's talk about specifically Piper here and her Patreon link. Now I just said I prefer having a website link and owning a domain and all that. In this case, however, it being a Patreon link signals to the crowd, so to me, the regular guy scrolling through Facebook and seeing this cute animal and enjoying it, that, hey guy, I draw cute animals. And on Patreon, there is probably more of this for you. And fair enough, I followed the link and saw she does daily drawings and, and I was like, hell yeah, I want more of that in my life and since then I'm supporting her. So in this case, it works nicely. And it doesn't mean that she just does crowd drawings for the crowd, she probably does more, but with those pictures she pursued specific goal of drawing people to her patron and it works brilliantly. She gets hundreds of shares on Facebook and everyone sees those cute animals and end the link to where to find more. So those rules I'm telling you are rules of thumb. None of them are set in stone depending on who you are and what you want to achieve. All of this stuff varies, but I still believe you really need to be branding and tagging in the picture itself, so it's just a robust link that will always lead back to you. And also, it doesn't always have to necessarily be a website name if your artist name is distinct enough and you can be at least googled if not found directly through your website link. That is good enough too, in my opinion. One more thing that some people do and some people don't when branding their picture is including the copyright symbol. A disclaimer, I am not a lawyer, nor am I any sort of a legal professional. I'm just an artist talking stuff on the internet. So I cannot give you any legal advice. However, I can give you my personal opinion. So in my personal opinion, as far as I understand copyright laws, in the most countries, it is not absolutely necessary to include the copyright symbol in your picture. The moment you create something, you automatically own the copyright just because you have created it automatically. 
However, I also believe that adding the copyright symbol in your picture can help remind the people who are looking at it that the picture is indeed copyrighted. So some of them might not think about it or not know it or whatever. So I might actually start including the copyright symbol in my pictures as well. So far I have not done that, but I might do so in the future. Of course, if you want to be legally sure about this, then you should talk to your lawyer. By the way, what I'm not talking about in this video is this sort of a theft protection watermarking, where you just make your entire picture unusable to potential picture thieves, or at least a lot harder because they would have to Photoshop it all out. Now, I'm not telling you not to do this. If you want to do this, by all means, go ahead. But I will give you my personal opinion on why I don't do this. Yes, I believe it reduces the amount of potential picture thefts that are gonna happen to your work, but I also think at the same time it makes, it makes your picture a lot less attractive to potential reposters. If I was a reposter and I would see this, I would not share it. It's just too obscured by the watermark for me, and also to me personally it signals like, hey, stay away from this picture, don't touch it, don't share it, don't look at it. So this is also something to consider. Now let's talk about font choice in more detail. If you do cartoon-like work like we see here, then you can also use a more funny font that matches the theme. It is fine as long as you know your font matches the overall aesthetic of your work. We also can see this here with Mike Correiro where he uses this bold and uh, cursive font and it kind of matches the rest of the aesthetics here, don't you think? So you can do this kind of thing, however, then you have to watch out if you change your style or uh, just bring out a work that has a bit of a different style than what you usually do, like we see here. This is from Paul Taylor, the Wopsy Square guy. So he does the Wopsy Square comic usually. And this link, this font looks fitting on his comics. But on this uh, real life photograph of that figurine, it does not fit anymore in my opinion, because um, it's just a stylistic disconnect that's going on here. So if you do a lot of different things, then I advise to use something that is really dry as a font, like I'm doing here. Uh, granted, my font choice is also because a lot of my stuff tends to be really technical or try to be really sleek. Uh, if we take Felon here, for example, who does those stock photos. Yeah, he's a bit more of a military drama queen, so we have more of a fancy font going on here, but it fits. So the takeaway point regarding font choice is either make sure it doesn't grab any artistic attention at all, or make sure the font choice fits the uh, overall theme of what you are showing in the picture. For a lot of beginning artists, it's better to go with a really neutral font because a lot of beginning artists, especially if you're not a graphical designer, uh, tend to take ugly fonts for whatever reason. So uh, once you really are far down your road and have a developed style, you can consider about using a font like this if it fits, if your work looks like this, or using a font like this if your work looks like this, and so on and so forth. But for the start, I recommend just uh, as neutral as possible font styles. There are two things that I see even professionals do that are completely unnecessary when it comes to fonts. So if we take this 2013 uh, picture of Mike Carrera with this marking right here, we see that the font is stretched. If you don't know a lot about fonts, you probably can't see it and can't tell the difference, but to any person that has experience with fonts or graphical design in general, it will be noticeable. Uh, now, Mike is obviously not a noob, he's one of the world's best concept artists. But even he has done that. So for whatever reason, we as artists feel the need to change the standard settings on everything, to stretch something, to scale something. He does this a lot better, by the way, now that he doesn't mess with the font. It looks just so much cleaner. But uh, stretching a font is it generally something you should avoid. There is no reason for doing it. And it will just signal noobness to people who know stuff about fonts. We can also see some um, excessive spacing going on in this one. Now Felon also has done this. This is a lot better, like there is a lot of spacing, but not too much. But here it's just stretched too damn far. Again, it doesn't invalidate whatever else the person is doing or make their everything unusable. And as you can see, you can still read the font and all that. It just makes it look a little bit less pretty. 
So if you're going for pretty with fonts but don't know exactly what you're doing with your fonts, just leave them at standard settings. Let's talk about signatures. In general, I do not consider signatures to be viable branding because it is oftentimes a lot harder to track back the artist who made the picture. But if your signature is clearly readable, such as in this case, it also can work. If we take another example of my friend Tom right here, it's also a nice picture and all, but the signature is somewhere faintly appearing in the corner and I cannot, for the love of God, decipher what it says. I might be seeing a T, which is a part of Tom, but, you know, this does not serve as a sufficient branding. Like, if I want to find out who made this, this will forever remain a mystery, unless a reverse image search spits something out, or I'm lucky enough that uh, Bob's art blog mentioned who the artist is. Here is something that Tom did, by the way, for his company, as opposed to this one, which is a private picture. But here he did it for his company Life Adventure, whose tag you can see in the corner. And yeah, this is proper branding. A faint signature isn't. A non-faint signature also isn't, but is not as bad as a faint one. So you can add signatures to your artworks all you want for the traditional and emotional value and whatever other reasons you might have, but in my opinion it does not replace a proper branding, tagging, backlinking, whatever you want to call it. Let's also talk about another thing that I sometimes see people do that does not serve as proper branding for me. And that is, if you imagine this logo was here, but not the text on the bottom. So you just have this artwork and you have a logo. Good luck figuring out who made this. And even if you're already super famous, it is only going to be the people who already follow you that will recognize your logo. Someone who is entirely new to your work would see the artwork, would see the logo and still be none the wiser about who made it. So there is that. Unless your logo includes your text. Here it says, for example, Creature Design Workshop. Granted, just the logo wouldn't work in this case because the text is too small when scaled like this, so I would suggest scaling it up somehow, but Mike is also sufficiently marking his picture otherwise. But just as a logo with text, this doesn't work. What would have worked just as a logo is this, that is for Dustwind, this does the job because you can clearly read the name of whatever it is. You can punch this into Google. So this was a computer game that I worked on. And it also has the website link and all. Sufficient would be just the website link or just the logo. But I felt like including both for the maximum comfort for the end user. So you can do this. And if you do a logo, make sure it actually reads what it is all about. Then you can get away with just a logo if you want. Now let's talk about what is a good logo versus a bad logo. So generally speaking, for the sake of this video, without going into all the depth of logo design in general, a good logo for branding confidently occupies its own space and doesn't mess with the rest of the picture or is so well integrated that it just flows with the rest of the picture effortlessly, like you would see here. This could have been a logo, you know. I mean, it is in a way already a logo because it's a very stylized font, but if it was like a pictorial logo, like a pictogram, this would still flow. Or it dominantly occupies a part of the space. You can also see this here with this nuclear snail logo down here. What a good logo for branding is not is something like we have in these examples down here. And those people are fine with me criticizing their work. They literally have asked me to do this. So let's talk about this, which is probably the worst example in the batch. Um, and not for the reasons you might think. Conceptually, this logo is actually pretty cool. I can see this uh, V-shaped, triangular-shaped composition. The name is cool. I can see the what it's actually called, those hammers representing the forge and those th three cool doggy dogs, the composition is nice. What however isn't nice and completely destroys the whole thing is that it looks half finished or just like a squiggly sketch. It's just a bunch of lines. I have honestly, I might be wrong, but I've honestly never seen a logo that is just a bunch of lines as opposed to a bunch of surfaces like here or here, 
that really does the job. Now you might say Mike's logo is a bunch of lines, but it's not. It is enclosed in that circle and also the those smaller lines do combine themselves into that creature-like organic shape. So it's kind of different. It's kind of a thing in between and being a super professional, he can also pull this off. But for the most part, most logos that look like a bunch of lines that I've ever seen do not look that well especially on pictures, because they tend to halfway integrate themselves into pictures. So neither is it dominantly occupying a bunch of space, nor is it really integrated. So this is kind of half cutting into the black of the those creases of the wood as well. It's half clipping the rifle, which is a really nice rifle, by the way. So I would recommend just finishing this and working more with surfaces and less with a bunch of lines here for a confident logo. Otherwise, man, power to you, 3 Dog Forge. It's a good concept, it's a good name, I like it, just finish the logo properly. Another example of not such a good logo is here, Unorthodox Entertainment Company. Now, they're going for unorthodox. Whether or not you like their designs is a different question entirely, but as far as the logo goes, like, yeah, this part actually transports what it needs to. My problem here is, one, you're not doing any sort of a contrast outline or underlayer for this, so as soon as there is some white, it is eating the white of your logo, and it is already hard to read as it is. It's just barely readable enough already on a good background, so th this is here is actually a lot better. You have white, you have black, you can read it whatever background it is on. You might also consider fading the, this to like 75% or something if you want so uh, that it's less in your face but still readable and noticeable. I would completely ditch this U. It doesn't really add anything. It's not a cool pictogram like the three dogs here or the snail or the time vehicle looking vehicle logo right here or like this creature for the creature design workshop. It's just a U from an unorthodox, like, it doesn't add anything, it adds color, which is, um, you can do color sometimes, I won't go in depth on that. Just ditch the U, man, move the rest, which is already crazy enough, into one of the corners, fade it a bit and do it consistently in one of the corners. That is my recommendation to you, don't have it clip into the picture, don't have it mess with the picture space and picture contents. That will be better. Uh, another logo, something in between from Blasting Phoenix. Now the one thing that's going on here is two different styles, two different graphic styles. Yes, I know it's supposed to look like a this Blasting Phoenix is blasting organically out of this mechanical gear thing, but that's not how you do it, just using a tribal-like style with something that has really angular mechanical lines. You need some sort of a common visual language Anyway, also it works nicely here, where it just looks like it's part of a background. It doesn't work so well here, where it's not clear whether or not those splotches here are part of the material artwork itself, or are they part of the logo. It's clipping, it's messing with it, it's just confusing in this one. And that is what you get for having a logo that has a lot of um, open surfaces that go outward and a lot of outward flying debris and detail and all that and a logo that is beautiful on its own i'm sure it looks great as a wallpaper but it's just too loaded to uh work here it does work here where it can blend into the background yes but that is a very conditional working logo in my opinion another logo we have here is from paul taylor that i've uh, shown before i think this is all, all right I mean, I can see it's Warrior Princess, we have this skull and this uh, female uh, gender symbol here, so far so good. I do not like how the skull borders are clipping into the edges of this those straight lines. In my opinion, either scale it down to leave sufficient padding space or scale it all the way out. I also don't think the W adds a lot. It's same thing as here with this U for the unorthodox, it's the W for the warrior, but so what? Just put the skull inside of here, man, with sufficient padding, that will do it a lot more honors. Also we have a, a faster clock of uh, fonts here. You have one font on the warrior princess, you have a different font on Wopsy Square going on here. Uh, this one fits a lot better, obviously, to the work at hand. Um, I also discussed the HTTP and WW and slashes and all that, you don't need that, uh, and I've talked about the comic-like font. Additionally, we have the problem that this logo is really bordering this um, 
font link right here so I would solve it somehow nicer so it's not biting knocking into each other additionally we have the problem here and I'm pretty sure it's just work in progress pictures that's why you have that cluttered workshop background but there is just so much going on in the background man even if it's a bit blurry plus that logo plus the link plus everything is touching each other and the logo is almost touching her and it's just too much chaos going on overall here it's a bit better because the background is more blurred and uh, I will also make a um, uh, video about photographing your stuff, be it cosplay or scale figures or whatever, or props. Otherwise, the work itself, it's great, I like it. I love seeing you do something that is not comics. <laughs> As I've told you, I'm myself learning to draw now, so wonder how that will turn out. So this much I have to say about logos. Here is another thing I would recommend you not do. And it's when your business or your art artist alias is kind of like your name, or really close, so my name is Dimitri Zaitsev and I am also Dimitri Zaitsev Design. So here I have my name two times already, but then I also have my homepage, which is also my name, and then I have it three times. To me this looks a bit narcissistic or just weird. Now it's kind of different here with Mike, where it also says... Uh, it, it is his signature, which is aesthetically nice, and it's just a part of the artwork, more or less. And it also says MikeCarrero.com. Alright, so far so good. But if you, like, triple name tag your stuff like this, I would recommend you find some different solution. Sometimes I've been in situations where I need to or want to credit multiple major contributors to a picture. In this case, it's for example Elliot who shot the picture, it's Anthony who is appearing here and has made his costume and me with my own costume. In this one, by the way, Anthony is on the left, so his name is on the left and I'm on the right, so my name is on the right. The way I personally approach this is I will tag in the picture itself the major contributors. So in this case, again, Elliot who shot it and the two people appearing here. I will not go into minute detail of writing my name under here as well, just for the reason that I helped Anthony a tiny bit with his own costume. It's not worth adding additional text there, you know? So that's how I do it. Uh, same thing with photographers. Uh, I will usually ask the photographer to give me the picture unmarked and I will add my own marking, which will include them. And I will also not be a pain in the ass for them and insist they use this. I just tell them, you know what, you use it on your presences as you want and I will use it on mine as I want. This is the way I do this. You might go a different way about this. Uh, if there are some uh, more minor contributors to this, for example, this gun was uh, made by Ivan, he lent it to me and I got those glasses from Mark for this photo shoot and the festival is Wasteland Weekend, I will just mention all of that uh, stuff that is not from major contributors to a picture somewhere on Facebook, in the comments, whatever, but it doesn't have to go into the tags, in my opinion. Now let's create a Photoshop tagging action that I've talked about at the start of the video. I prefer actions to plopping in a PNG with your logo and text, because A, I don't use the logos, so I don't need to plop in a logo, so I can get away with an action and B, an action allows me to edit the text. So if I have multiple contributors like I just talked about, I can just duplicate this. Come on, Photoshop. Ah. <laughs> there we go. I can duplicate this and go like Elliot Montello was here too, whatever. So I can tag multiple people or I can just edit this if for some reason it's not the site I want to direct the people to, but which it usually is. So let's go ahead and make a new action, demo tag. And it's recording right now, it's going to record everything I do. So the first thing I do is make sure that the foreground color is white, which it already is. I go to my text tool. I choose the proper font, which is already selected, and then I will just click once without accidentally dragging a small text box. I just click and let go. Then I type in what I want to type. Nuclearsnail.com Nuclear-snail.com, that is correct. So what I will do now is I will scale it to appropriate size. Before you do any of this, you need to be sure that your picture is the size you want to publish it in. This size is fine for me, so I will hit cancel. 
so you do your picture sizing before you do the tag so that then you can scale the tag to be of an appropriate size it doesn't really matter if it's this big or that big just make sure it's something not too obtrusive but still readable there is no set golden rule as to how big it has to be i'll just leave it this big then i go and double click next to the layer here and i go down to stroke and i will accept the default black stroke of three pixels white font with a black outline is something they use for movie subtitles as well for this reason watch this no matter where i go i can read this clearly i can even read this clearly if i reduce the opacity to 70 percent right here i just pressed seven on my keyboard so I can still read it, even if it's clipping through white portions of my image. I can disable this effect, and now you can see that I don't... I can't read it quite that well anymore, where it's clipping into white. Enable, and there we go, it's great again. Now I press Ctrl A to select my entire canvas, and I am in my Move tool, or whatever it's called, yeah, the Move tool, the V on the keyboard. I press this to align it on the right and I press this to align it on the bottom. I press Ctrl D to deselect. Then I, I make sure again that I'm at the V tool, also known as Move tool. I press upwards one, two, three times. That looks good. And to the left one, two, three times. That is good. And this is how you do it. Obviously, if you have a lot of loaded detail going on in this corner and you don't want to cover it, you can also move it to the different corner for the sake of that one picture but usually bottom right works fine for me so note that in order to stop recording the action and finalize it i need to stop it with this button otherwise it will just keep recording and that's not something you want after you're done executing the actions that go into the action so let's rewind all of the history that, that happened here and play our demo tag there we go, there it is, and then you just save the picture. So I hope this video was useful to you and that you have learned about tagging, branding, and backlinking, whatever you may call this. Good luck doing this, good luck with your artistic endeavors, subscribe to my channel if you like what you see, and also if you like post-apocalyptic costumes, which are the main topic of my channel. Also check out all the artists that you liked from this video, after all, they're tagged in their own pictures, which is why you can find them without me linking to them in the video description, because I won't do that. Because the entire point of this video is that tagging or branding is supposed to work within the picture itself. I will see you in the next episode, and until then, hail the snail.